40. Answers to Questions on Christianity First published as a pamphlet by the Electrical and Musical Industries Christian Fellowship, Hayes, Middlesex, 1944, and subsequently in Undeceptions, 1971, and Timeless at Heart, 1991. Lewis I have been asked to open with a few words on Christianity and modern industry. Now, modern industry is a subject of which I know nothing at all. But for that very reason, it may illustrate what Christianity, in my opinion, does and does not do. Christianity does not replace the technical. When it tells you to feed the hungry, it doesn't give you lessons in cookery. If you want to learn that, you must go to a cook rather than a Christian. If you are not a professional economist and have no experience of industry, simply being a Christian won't give you the answer to industrial problems. My own idea is that modern industry is a radically hopeless system. You can improve wages, hours, conditions, etc., but all that doesn't cure the deepest trouble, i.e., that numbers of people are kept all their lives doing dull repetition work, which gives no full play to their faculties. How that is to be overcome, I do not know. If a single country abandoned the system, it would merely fall a prey to the other countries which hadn't abandoned it. I don't know the solution. That is not the kind of thing Christianity teaches a person like me. Let's now carry on with the questions. Question 1. Christians are taught to love their neighbours. How, therefore, can they justify their attitude of supporting the war? Lois. You are told to love your neighbour as yourself. How do you love yourself? When I look into my own mind, I find that I do not love myself by thinking myself a dear old chap or having affectionate feelings. I do not think that I love myself because I am particularly good, but just because I am myself and quite apart from my character. I might detest something which I have done. Nevertheless, I do not cease to love myself. In other words, that definite distinction that Christians make between hating sin and loving the sinner is one that you have been making in your own case since you were born. You dislike what you have done, but you don't cease to love yourself. You may even think that you ought to be hanged. You may even think that you ought to go to the police and own up and be hanged. Love is not an affectionate feeling, but a steady wish for the loved person's ultimate good as far as it can be obtained. It seems to me, therefore, that when the worst comes to the worst, if you cannot restrain a man by any method except by trying to kill him, then a Christian must do that. That is my answer, but I may be wrong. It is very difficult to answer, of course. Question 2. Supposing a factory worker asked you, How can I find God? How would you reply? Lewis, I don't see how the problem would be different for a factory worker than for anyone else. The primary thing about any man is that he is a human being, sharing all the ordinary human temptations and assets. What is the special problem about the factory worker? But perhaps it is worth saying this. Christianity really does two things about conditions here and now in this world. One, it tries to make them as good as possible, i.e. to reform them, but also... 2. It fortifies you against them in so far as they remain bad. If what was in the questioner's mind was this problem of repetition work, then the factory worker's difficulty is the same as any other man confronted with any sorrow or difficulty. People will find God if they consciously seek from him the right attitude towards all unpleasant things, if that is the point of the question. Question 3. Will you please say how you would define a practicing Christian? Are there any other varieties? Lewis. Certainly there are a great many other varieties. It depends, of course, on what you mean by practicing Christian. If you mean one who has practiced Christianity in every respect at every moment of his life, then there is only one on record, Christ himself. In that sense, there are no practicing Christians, but only Christians who, in varying degrees, try to practice it and fail in varying degrees, and then start again. A perfect practice of Christianity would, of course, consist in a perfect imitation of the life of Christ. I mean, in so far as it was applicable in one's own particular circumstances. Not in an idiotic sense. 
It doesn't mean that every Christian should grow a beard, or be a bachelor, or become a traveling preacher. It means that every single act and feeling, every experience, whether pleasant or unpleasant, must be referred to God. It means looking at everything as something that comes from Him, and always looking to Him and asking His will first, and saying, How would He wish me to deal with this? A kind of picture or pattern, in a very remote way, of the relation between the perfect Christian and his God, would be the relation of the good dog to its master. This is only a very imperfect picture, though, because the dog hasn't reason like its master. Whereas we do share in God's reason, even if in an imperfect and uninterrupted way. Interrupted because we don't think rationally for very long at a time. It's too tiring, and we haven't information to understand things fully, and our intelligence itself has certain limitations. In that way, we are more like God than the dog is like us, though, of course, there are other ways in which the dog is more like us than we are like God. It is only an illustration. A Question 4. What justification, on ethical grounds and on the grounds of social expediency, exists for the Church's attitude towards venereal disease and prophylaxis and publicity in connection with it? Lewis, I need further advice on that question, and then perhaps I can answer it. Can the questioner say which Church he has in mind? A voice. The Church concerned is the Church of England and its attitude, though not written, is implicit in that it has more or less banned all publicity in connection with prophylactic methods of combating venereal disease. The view of some is that moral punishment should not be avoided. Lewis, I haven't myself met any clergyman of the Church of England who held that view, and I don't hold it myself. There are obvious objections to it. After all, it isn't only venereal disease that can be regarded as a punishment for bad conduct. Indigestion in old age may be the result of overeating in earlier life, but no one objects to advertisements for Beecham's pills. I, at any rate, strongly dissent from the view that you've mentioned. Question 5. Many people feel resentful or unhappy because they think they are the target of unjust fate. These feelings are stimulated by bereavement, illness, deranged domestic or working conditions, or the observation of suffering in others. What is the Christian view of this problem? Lewis The Christian view is that men are created to be in a certain relationship to God. If we are in that relation to Him, the right relation to one another will follow inevitably. Christ said it was difficult for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 19, verse 23, Mark chapter 10, verse 23, Luke chapter 18, verse 24 referring, no doubt, to riches in the ordinary sense. But I think it really covers riches in every sense, good fortune, health, popularity, and all the things one wants to have. All these things tend, just as money tends, to make you feel independent of God, because if you have them, you are happy already and contented in this life. You don't want to turn away to anything more, and so you try to rest in a shadowy happiness, as if it could last forever but God wants to give you a real and eternal happiness. Consequently, he may have to take all these riches away from you. If he doesn't, you will go on relying on them. It sounds cruel, doesn't it? But I am beginning to find out that what people call the cruel doctrines are really the kindest ones in the long run. I used to think it was a cruel doctrine to say that troubles and sorrows were punishments. But I find in practice that when you are in trouble, the moment you regard it as a punishment, it becomes easier to bear. If you think of this world as a place intended simply for our happiness, you find it quite intolerable. Think of it as a place of training and correction, and it's not so bad. Imagine a set of people all living in the same building. Half of them think it is a hotel, the other half think it is a prison. Those who think it a hotel might regard it as quite intolerable, and those who thought it was a prison might decide that it was really surprisingly comfortable, so that what seems the ugly doctrine is the one that comforts and strengthens you in the end. The people who try to hold an optimistic view of this world would become pessimists. The people who hold a pretty stern view of it become optimistic. Question 6. 
Materialists and some astronomers suggest that the solar planetary system and life as we know it was brought about by an accidental stellar collision. What is the Christian view of this theory? Lewis, if the solar system was brought about by an accidental collision, then the appearance of organic life on this planet was also an accident, and the whole evolution of man was an accident too. If so, then all our present thoughts are mere accidents the accidental by-product of the movement of atoms. And this holds for the thoughts of the materialists and astronomers as well as for anyone else's. But if their thoughts, i.e. of materialism and astronomy, are merely accidental by-products, why should we believe them to be true? I see no reason for believing that one accident should be able to give me a correct account of all the other accidents. It's like expecting that the accidental shape taken by the splash when you upset a milk jug should give you a correct account of how the jug was made and why it was upset. Question 7. Is it true that Christianity, especially the Protestant forms, tends to produce a gloomy, joyless condition of society which is like a pain in the neck to most people? Lewis. As to the distinction between Protestant and other forms of Christianity, it is very difficult to answer. I find by reading about the sixteenth century that people like Sir Thomas More, for whom I have a great respect, always regarded Martin Luther's doctrines not as gloomy thinking, but as wishful thinking. I doubt whether we can make a distinction between Protestant and other forms in this respect whether Protestantism is gloomy, and whether Christianity at all produces gloominess, I find it very difficult to answer, as I have never lived in a completely non-Christian society, nor a completely Christian one, and I wasn't there in the sixteenth century, and only have my knowledge from reading books. I think there is about the same amount of fun and gloom in all periods. The poems, novels, letters, etc., of every period all seem to show that. But again, I don't really know the answer, of course. I wasn't there. Question 8. Is it true that Christians must be prepared to live a life of personal discomfort and self-sacrifice in order to qualify for pie in the sky? Lewis. All people, whether Christians or not, must be prepared to live a life of discomfort. It is impossible to accept Christianity for the sake of finding comfort. But the Christian tries to lay himself open to the will of God to do what God wants him to do. You don't know in advance whether God is going to set you to do something difficult or painful, or something that you will quite like. And some people of heroic mould are disappointed when the job doled out to them turns out to be something quite nice. But you must be prepared for the unpleasant things and the discomforts. I don't mean fasting and things like that. They are a different matter. When you are training soldiers in manoeuvres, you practice with blank ammunition, because you would like them to have practice before meeting the real enemy. So we must practice in abstaining from pleasures which are not in themselves wicked. If you don't abstain from pleasure, you won't be good when the time comes along. It is purely a matter of practice. Voice. Are not practices like fasting and self-denial borrowed from earlier or more primitive religions? Lois. I can't say for certain which bits came into Christianity from earlier religions. An enormous amount did. I should find it hard to believe Christianity if that were not so. I couldn't believe that 999 religions were completely false and the remaining one true. In reality, Christianity is primarily the fulfillment of the Jewish religion, but also the fulfillment of what was vaguely hinted in all the religions at their best. What was vaguely seen in them all comes into focus in Christianity, just as God himself comes into focus by becoming a man. I take it that the speaker's remarks on earlier religions are based on evidence about modern savages. I don't think it is good evidence. Modern savages usually represent some decay in culture. You find them doing things which look as if they had a fairly civilized basis once, which they have forgotten. To assume that primitive man was exactly like the modern savage is unsound. A voice. Could you say any more on how one discovers whether a task is laid on one by God or whether it comes in some other way? If we cannot distinguish between the pleasant and the unpleasant things, it is a complicated matter. Lois. We are guided by the ordinary rules of moral behaviour. 
which I think are more or less common to the human race and quite reasonable and demanded by the circumstances. I don't mean anything like sitting down and waiting for a supernatural vision. A voice. We don't qualify for heaven by practice, but salvation is obtained at the cross. We do nothing to obtain it but follow Christ. We may have pain or tribulation, but nothing we do qualifies us for heaven but Christ. Lewis. The controversy about faith and works is one that has gone on for a very long time, and it is a highly technical matter. I personally rely on the paradoxical text, Work out your own salvation, for it is God that worketh in you. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. It looks as if in one sense we do nothing, and in another case we do a damned lot. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, but you must have it in you before you can work it out. But I have no wish to go further into it, as it would interest no one but the Christians present, would it? Question 9. Would the application of Christian standards bring an end or greatly reduce scientific and material progress? In other words, is it wrong for a Christian to be ambitious and strive for personal success? Lewis. It is easier to think of a simplified example. How would the application of Christianity affect anyone on a desert island? Would he be less likely to build a comfortable hut? The answer is no. There might come a particular moment, of course, when Christianity would tell him to bother less about the hut, i.e., if he were in danger of coming to think that the hut was the most important thing in the universe. But there is no evidence that Christianity would prevent him from building it. Ambition. We must be careful what we mean by it. If it means the desire to get ahead of other people, which is what I think it does mean, then it is bad. If it means simply wanting to do a thing well, then it is good. It isn't wrong for an actor to want to act his part as well as it can possibly be acted. But the wish to have his name in bigger type than the other actors is a bad one. A voice. It's all right to be a general, but if it is one's ambition to be a general, then you shouldn't become one. A Lewis. The mere event of becoming a general isn't either right or wrong in itself. What matters morally is your attitude towards it. The man may be thinking about winning a war. He may be wanting to be a general because he honestly thinks that he has a good plan and is glad of a chance to carry it out. That's all right. But if he is thinking, what can I get out of the job, or how can I get on the front page of the illustrated news, then it is all wrong. And what we call ambition usually means the wish to be more conspicuous or more successful than someone else. It is this competitive element in it that is bad. It is perfectly reasonable to want to dance well or to look nice. But when the dominant wish is to dance better or look nicer than the others, when you begin to feel that if the others danced as well as you or looked as nice as you, that would take all the fun out of it, then you are going wrong. A voice I am wondering how far we can ascribe to the work of the devil those very legitimate desires that we indulge in. Some people have a very sensitive conception of the presence of the devil. Others haven't. Is the devil as real as we think he is? And that doesn't trouble some people, since they have no desire to be good. But others are continually harassed by the old man himself. Lewis. No reference to the devil or devils is included in any Christian creeds and it is quite possible to be a Christian without believing in them. I do believe such beings exist, but that is my own affair. Supposing there to be such beings, the degree to which humans were conscious of their presence would presumably vary very much. I mean, the more a man was in the devil's power, the less he would be aware of it, on the principle that a man is still fairly sober as long as he knows he's drunk. It is the people who are fully awake and trying hard to be good who would be most aware of the devil. It is when you start arming against Hitler that you first realize your country is full of Nazi agents. Of course, they don't want you to know they are there. In the same way, the devil doesn't want you to believe in the devil. If devils exist, their first aim is to give you an anesthetic, to put you off your guard. Only if that fails do you become aware of them. A voice. Does Christianity retard scientific advancement? Or does it approve of those who help spiritually others who are on the road to perdition by scientifically removing the environmental causes of the trouble? Lewis. 
Yes, in the abstract it is certainly so. At a particular moment, if most human beings are concentrating only on material improvements in the environment, it may be the duty of Christians to point out, and pretty loudly, that this isn't the only thing that matters. But as a general rule, it is in favour of all knowledge and all that will help the human race in any way. Question 10. The Bible was written thousands of years ago for people in a lower state of mental development than today. Many portions seem preposterous in the light of modern knowledge. In view of this, should not the Bible be rewritten with the object of discarding the fabulous and reinterpreting the remainder? Lewis. First of all, as to the people in a lower state of mental development, I am not so sure what lurks behind that. If it means that people ten thousand years ago did not know a good many things that we know now, of course I agree. But if it means that there has been any advance in intelligence in that time, I believe there is no evidence for any such thing. The Bible can be divided into two parts, the Old and the New Testaments. The Old Testament contains fabulous elements. The New Testament consists mostly of teaching, not of narrative at all. But where it is narrative, it is, in my opinion, historical. As to the fabulous element in the Old Testament, I very much doubt if you would be wise to chuck it out. What you get is something coming gradually into focus. First you get scattered through the heathen religions all over the world, but still quite vague and mythical, the idea of a god who is killed and broken and then comes to life again. No one knows where he is supposed to have lived and died. He is not historical. Then you get the Old Testament. Religious ideas get a bit more focused. Everything is now connected with a particular nation. And it comes still more into focus as it goes on. Jonah and the Whale, the Book of Jonah. Noah and his Ark, Genesis chapters 6 to 8, are fabulous. But the court history of King David, 2 Samuel chapter 2, 1 Kings chapter 2, is probably as reliable as the court history of Louis the Fourteenth. Then, in the New Testament, the thing really happens. The dying God really appears, as a historical person, living in a definite place and time. If we could sort out all the fabulous elements in the earlier stages and separate them from the historical ones, I think we might lose an essential part of the whole process. That is my own idea. Question 11. Which of the religions of the world gives to its followers the greatest happiness? Lewis. Which of the religions of the world gives to its followers the greatest happiness? While it lasts, the religion of worshipping oneself is the best. I have an elderly acquaintance of about eighty who has lived a life of unbroken selfishness and self-admiration from the earliest years and is, more or less, I regret to say, one of the happiest men I know. From the moral point of view, it is very difficult. I am not approaching the question from that angle. As you perhaps know, I haven't always been a Christian. I didn't go to religion to make me happy. I always knew a bottle of port would do that. If you want a religion to make you feel really comfortable, I certainly don't recommend Christianity. I am certain there must be a patent American article on the market which will suit you far better, but I can't give any advice on it. Question 12. Are there any unmistakable outward signs in a person surrendered to God? Would he be cantankerous? Would he smoke? Lois, I think of the advertisements for White Smiles toothpaste, saying that it is the best on the market. If they are true, it would follow that 1. Anyone who starts using it will have better teeth. 2. Anyone using it has better teeth than he would have if he weren't using it. But you can't test it in the case of one who has naturally bad teeth and uses it, and compare him with a healthy negro who has never used toothpaste at all. Take the case of a sour old maid who is a Christian but cantankerous. On the other hand, take some pleasant and popular fellow but who has never been to church. Who knows how much more cantankerous the old maid might be if she were not a Christian, and how much more likable the nice fellow might be if he were a Christian. You can't judge Christianity simply by comparing the product in those two people. You would need to know what kind of raw material Christ was working on in both cases. As an illustration, let us take a case of industrialism. Let us take two factories. Factory A 
with poor and inadequate plant, and Factory B with first-class modern plant. You can't judge by the outside. You must consider the plant and the methods by which they are run, and, considering the plant at Factory A, it may be a wonder it does anything at all. And, considering the new machinery at Factory B, it may be a wonder it doesn't do better. Question 13. What is your opinion about raffles within the plant, no matter how good the cause, which, not infrequently, is given less prominence than the alluring list of prizes? Lewis. A gambling ought never to be an important part of a man's life. If it is a way in which large sums of money are transferred from person to person without doing any good, e.g. producing employment, goodwill, etc., then it is a bad thing. If it is carried out on a small scale, I am not sure that it is bad. I don't know much about it, because it is about the only vice to which I have no temptation at all, and I think it is a risk to talk about things which are not in my own make-up, because I don't understand them. If anyone comes to me asking me to play bridge for money, I just say, How much do you hope to win? Take it and go away. Question 14. Many people are quite unable to understand the theological differences which have caused divisions in the Christian Church. Do you consider that these differences are fundamental, and is the time now ripe for reunion? Lewis. The time is always ripe for reunion. Divisions between Christians are a sin and a scandal, and Christians ought at all times to be making contributions towards reunion, if it is only by their prayers. I am only a layman and a recent Christian, and I do not know much about these things, but in all the things which I have written and thought I have always stuck to traditional dogmatic positions. The result is that letters of agreement reach me from what are ordinarily regarded as the most different kinds of Christians. For instance, I get letters from Jesuits, monks, nuns, and also from Quakers and Welsh dissenters, and so on. So it seems to me that the extreme elements in every church are nearest one another, and the liberal and broad-minded people in each body could never be united at all. The world of dogmatic Christianity is a place in which thousands of people of quite different types keep on saying the same thing, and the world of broad-mindedness and watered-down religion is a world where a small number of people, all of the same type, say totally different things and change their minds every few minutes. We shall never get reunion from them. Question 15. In the past, the Church used various kinds of compulsion in attempts to force a particular brand of Christianity on the community. Given sufficient power, is there not a danger of this sort of thing happening again? Lewis. Yes, I hear nasty rumours coming from Spain. Persecution is a temptation to which all men are exposed. I had a postcard signed M.D., saying that anyone who expressed and published his belief in the virgin birth should be stripped and flogged. That shows you how easily persecution of Christians by the non-Christians might come back. Of course, they wouldn't call it persecution. They'd call it compulsory re-education of the ideologically unfit, or something like that. But, of course, I have to admit that Christians themselves have been persecutors in the past. It was worse of them because they ought to have known better. They weren't worse in any other way. I detest every kind of religious compulsion. Only the other day I was writing an angry letter to the spectator about church parades in the home guard. Question 16. Is attendance at a place of worship or membership with a Christian community necessary to a Christian way of life? Lewis. That's a question which I cannot answer. My own experience is that when I first became a Christian about fourteen years ago, I thought that I could do it on my own, by retiring to my rooms and reading theology, and I wouldn't go to the churches and gospel halls. And then later I found that it was the only way of flying your flag. And, of course, I found that this meant being a target. It is extraordinary how inconvenient to your family it becomes for you to get up early to go to church. It doesn't matter so much if you get up early for anything else, but if you get up early to go to church, it's very selfish of you, and you upset the house. If there is anything in the teaching of the New Testament which is in the nature of a command, it is that you are obliged to take the sacrament, and you can't do it without going to church. I disliked very much their hymns, 
which I considered to be fifth-rate poems set to sixth-rate music. But as I went on, I saw the great merit of it. I came up against different people of quite different outlooks and different education, and then gradually my conceit just began peeling off. I realized that the hymns, which were just sixth-rate music, were nevertheless being sung with devotion and benefit by an old saint in elastic-sided boots in the opposite pew. And then you realize that you aren't fit to clean those boots. It gets you out of your solitary conceit. It is not for me to lay down laws, as I am only a layman, and I don't know much. Question 17. If it is true that one only has to want God enough in order to find Him, how can I make myself want Him enough to enable myself to find Him? Lewis. If you don't want God, why are you so anxious to want to want Him? I think that in reality the want is a real one, and I should say that this person has in fact found God although it may not be fully recognized yet. We are not always aware of things at the time they happen. At any rate, what is more important is that God has found this person, and that is the main thing. 